Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi and welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group Director, and I'm here with Bible teacher Mike DeStefano. He just brought a message called Christians in the Minority, and we're looking at Matthew 9, a very relevant message today and in fact some of the feedback that we got back from the postscript was just how relevant the message was just to everything as Christians that we are are walking through today so thank you for that absolutely welcome back yeah thank you glad to see you it's good to get back and have an update on how you're doing so we had uh, quite a few questions come in this week Um, so we'll just kind of jump into them the first one just an an easy question for you is what was the name of the minister referenced Um, was it old World War one vet, but we missed the name. Yeah, uh, his name is George McLeod. He okay. was an old Scottish minister and World War One vet. Uh, incredible impact in Scotland there. Great. Yeah. Um, as you mentioned in the message, mm-hmm. um, we're talking about just that shifting of culture where we're beginning to separate from culture. Um, and just this idea or this fear that the sky is falling and Christianity is going to be a thing of the past. And just right. you were going to talk a little bit in Postscript about just some statistics and what yeah. it's how that's shaping up. Yeah, so it's interesting. Uh, Pew Research just put out some statistics about how Christianity is declining in America. Mainline churches and Catholic churches are decreasing by like 8% per year. And the reaction to that on social media and in a lot of churches was uh, just chaos. You know, everyone sort of assumed this is the beginning of the end. And um, a guy named Ed Stetzer is a statistician and an author uh, who we went to go see as a a staff uh, Mm -hmm. maybe a year ago. And he's done some really fascinating work. And this is all I'll say towards this. Uh, While Christianity is declining in the main line, it's increasing in the evangelical denominations. Mm -hmm. Um, Church attendance is uh, statistically equal to what it was in the 1940s percentage wise. So it actually hasn't declined at all. Uh, What's happening is, and what he's saying is, and just for the sake of simplistic numbers, he's saying if from the beginning there was 25% of America that were actually practicing believers. So they were born again, had a conversion experience, it impacted their life in some way, they prayed with their kids, they went to church, whatever, 25% of America. Then, just for the sake of simplistic numbers, say there was another 25% that were atheist or identified as non-Christians. Uh, and he calls that, he calls them the nuns. Mm-hmm. Uh, then that means that in the middle, there was a whole 50% that were not quite practicing Christians and certainly not atheists. And that 50% for the first 300 years of Christianity took its cues from the Christians. And many of them were Christian nominally, but it Mm -hmm. didn't impact the way that they lived their lives. Now he's saying the shift that we're seeing is the people who were Christians in name only are taking their cues from and identifying themselves, self-identifying themselves as nuns or Mm -hmm. people that don't know the Lord. And so what's happening is not that Christianity is declining. Actually, almost nothing is changing. The only thing that's happening is that um, the lines are becoming more clear. Mm -hmm. And now we know who is really a practicing Christian and who's not, Uh, which actually I think is helpful for the church. Mm -hmm. And so we don't need to freak out. We don't need to stress out and think that the world's coming to an end. Really, nothing is changing except for we have a more accurate perspective on reality. So I wanted to address that. Yeah. And like you were saying today, that creates space for us to move into places and lives of people who are identifying themselves in a different different way now. Absolutely. It makes it clearer for us. Um, so with the relevance of the message, obviously in your workplace, um, even within your families, you're going to have people who don't line up with you, mm-hmm. um, with your values. Um, this person's asking, I think it's a really good question. Um, how can you create a culture of acceptance and value in work when there's there's rude behavior, there's things that are having to be confronted, and mm-hmm. so in trying to maintain this balance at work, like how how do you, what advice would you have for that? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think it sounds like she's a, uh, asking the question from the perspective of a leader or a manager dealing with unsubordinate, insubordinate, uncooperative mm-hmm. people. Um, I'll say something just briefly towards the business side of it and then I'll speak more personally and let other people who are more qualified speak to that. I just think in terms of being a Christian leader in the workplace, uh, it is important to hold your, um, your responsibilities at work and your faith and tension 
And um, I think the most important thing as far as addressing insubordinate behavior is first setting expectations and drawing from the, the principles that we see in the Bible and being clear about those expectations up front uh, that certain behavior is unacceptable. I think as a Christian, when we talk about, you know, deal with people in love and gentleness and respect, that we think that that means that we can't be stern, mm -hmm. but that's not the case. That wasn't the case with Jesus. I think if, we're, if everyone's clear about expectations and then we say there's a, if the, there's a violation of these expectations and there's consequences, that is more than acceptable as a Christian. The other thing I would say towards that is go find a company that does that well uh, that's produced some sort of material that will be helpful for you, and that will be much help, more helpful than anything that I will say. Uh, go find a company that you respect, that you're like, man, they do that, fantastic, and then go talk to them uh, and figure out how to do that in your workplace. As an individual Christian, I think we, I said earlier we have to hold our, um, our responsibilities at work and our faith in tension, and I think uh, the most important thing is that we recognize our faith as primary. And uh, though we want to do a good job at uh, being a manager and a leader, we want to, uh, more than that, be uh, a follower of Jesus and a representative of, of who he is and his person. And the one thing that I would speak towards that is uh, the passage in Romans where Paul says, um, as far as it is possible with you, be at peace with all people. And so you do what you can. And I love the, that little, uh, the way he phrases it at the beginning, as far as it is possible with you. So you do everything in your power to be a peacemaker, to create peace, to speak kindness, to speak love. But sometimes people just won't have it. Mm -hmm. And that's tough. Um, but your responsibility as a Christian is to, is to trust the Lord and say, I'm gonna be a peacemaker and do what I can towards that. Great, that's a good word. And so the next person has um, a lot of the same question, but looking at it from, from a different side, maybe with a family member. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of what you said makes sense if you're applying it to someone who's unrepentant, I mean, who is repentive or who is trying to improve or walk better. Um, but what about people in your life that their hearts just seemed hardened? Yeah. Um, how do you step into their world? Um, how do you uh, walk with them in love and not abandon them? Um, what, what would you say to that? Yeah, that's good. That's a good question. I think for that person, if they're listening, I would want to point them to the book of First Peter. I think Peter, throughout the entire five chapters of that book, will address that time and again. I want to read just a, a quick section of it that I think answers that question and may help everybody. Okay. First uh, Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 13, says, Now who's to harm you if you're zealous for what's good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But honor, your, honor Christ as holy in your hearts always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is within you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Mm -hmm. So I think three things to that person that they're dealing with somebody that may be even hostile or at least hard of heart towards their message. Peter gives them three action steps. The first is um, that you have no fear of them, that you recognize in your heart that um, my king has conquered the grave and he's risen to life. And so even in death, there's no harm for me. And so I know that might sound totally disconnected, but it's the, it's the base level of our confidence mm -hmm. that we would look and we'd say, there's nothing that this person could possibly do to harm me. The worst be done to me and I'm okay. Uh, and then we're not troubled. And that speaks, I think, to anxiety, that there's this mm -hmm. sense of uh, turmoil in Worry our soul. And, yeah. and, so, and so Jesus is saying, and Peter is saying, repent of that. Mm -hmm. Don't live in that. If you, if you start to feel that come up, just say, I have nothing to fear. God, you're good. You know their hearts. You know my hearts. And I'm going to trust you. So that's the first thing. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. The second thing is, honor Christ, uh, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy. And this helps me tremendously. When I start to feel anxiety or I start to feel fear, even about preaching, I think in my heart of Jesus as holy, the beauty of who he was, the perfection of his nature, and the fact that he is seated, enthroned above the heavens. And, and my job and my confidence is him and who he is, and I make much of him. And so that's, that's a valuable step for your soul. And then the third thing, those two are sort of internal. The last one is interpersonal. Mm -hmm. uh, and so then the last one is going to be always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is within you. Love the way he phrases that. He says, be prepared to make a defense when they ask. So answer in this way. So what he's saying is he's just finished saying, treat everyone with love, with respect, have a humble mind, a tender heart. Um, and so he's saying, that's your action step. You be real kind to them. You be real loving to them. And then pray, beg for an opportunity to speak, but do it as a response. Mm. So when they see your love, when they see there's something different about you and kind about you, and they ask, what is going on with you? Then you're ready. 
and you go, that's God answering my prayer. For now, I pray, I love the heck out of him. And then when that moment comes, we answer and we do it, he says, key with gentleness and respect. We do it with incredible kindness and respect for them as a human being made in the image of God, but broken like we all are. Great. That's great. Three steps. And so what are your thoughts on how is it possible and how this looks like to operate this way over a long period of time? Yeah. Um, for like maybe maybe a family member that it's years or a friend that you've been in relationship for years. Um, nothing is changing. You feel like you're doing all three of these things right. How, how can we not feel discouraged mm. or even inadequate yeah. in those moments? Yeah, that's good. I think to answer that, I have a family member who is a non-believer and when I was little, I remember he used to always kind of poke fun at Christianity and so it kind of like weirded me out. Like he was, he just, you know, kind of stood out in that way and I was kind of like scared. Um, but I remember I used to pray all the time that he would come to the Lord. Grew up uh, into college and nothing changed and um, I remember leaving one time for a trip and telling my friends, hey, I'm going to spend a lot of time with this family member and if you would just pray for opportunity. And it was right after uh, my, my grandmother passed away. And I remember it was the two of us and we were talking in a car or something. And I mean, just out of the blue, he started crying, which was not normal for him. And he just, he asked, um, do you think she's okay? I said, yeah. And he said, do you think she's in heaven? I said, yeah, I do. And he said, how do you know? And I got to in that moment, just mm -hmm. step into what I believe about Jesus. But it was a long time before we got to have a good conversation towards that. And for me, I surround myself with the community of God, continually pray, and then most importantly, honor Christ the Lord in my heart is holy and trust that he is, he's good and he's over all things. And when that moment is right, he'll give me the grace to speak clearly and respectfully. And that he's gone ahead of you in that time, yeah. you know, and prepared those moments or those times when you can be ready to speak into Absolutely. someone's life. Um, Thank you very much for being here with us today, and um, we look forward to seeing you back again soon. Yeah, All can't right. wait to be back. And thank you for joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.